Hi, I'm Howie Rosen. Welcome to this edition of One on One, which I think fittingly we are taping on Players Weekend in Major League Baseball. That's the weekend where the players get to put their nicknames on the back of their jerseys and everybody gets a big kick out of that. And what is fitting is that I am sitting with a man whose nickname is really one of the most endearing and in fact enduring in all of Mets history. If I say I'm sitting with a stork, you know, we're going to talk to George Theodore. Great to be back. How long has it been that you played 1973 and 1974 for the Mets? I know there's been the occasional uh, opportunity for you to get back here, but we haven't seen you in a while. So how long has it been? No, it's been, I think, 10 years. So uh, it's always great to come back. Now, George was a member of the 1973 National League champion Mets who might have played a bigger role if not for a play that, you know, sadly, I guess, in, in a lot of ways, George, came to define your career, at least to fans, to those who, you know, have a, a quick visceral memory of, of your career, the collision with Don Hahn. Does that still stick in your mind all these years later? Well, let me tell you, July 4th, I hit my first home run up in Montreal. Maury Allen's headline was, uh, which I had told him, 714 more to go. <laughs> and uh, so then three days later, I had the big collision uh, with Don Hahn going after the ball, which probably shouldn't have happened because the play before was a, gr a ground ball to the outfield, and uh, I made an error on it. And I said, I'll never let a ball get by me again. So then sure enough, Ralph Gar hits the ne next uh, batter, a line drive into left center field, and I go as fast as I can, and Don Hahn as well, and he was a great outfielder, and we collided at the fence, and uh, I got the worst of it with a dislocated hip. And yeah, that's changed the whole direction of my career. It was scary to watch, scary to wait to see them cart you off the field. What were the few fleeting thoughts you had going through your mind as you laid down there? Did you think it would be sort of career altering even in the moment? Ouch, ouch, <laughs> it was just agonizing pain. And believe it or not, uh, a few weeks before in San Diego, I woke up in a cold sweat and I was uh, had a dream that I was being pulled off the field and stretch, and sure enough, you know, uh, there's, Jerry Kuzman and Tug McGraw helping with the stretcher and everything. So you had a premonition? Uh, yes. Was it defined as such to where you saw yourself colliding with a teammate? No, I didn't know that. I just knew that uh, I was injured and I was being carried off. And so, uh, yeah, it was a frightening thing. And I was in such pain that that's all I could think about, stop the pain. And they couldn't give me anything because uh, they didn't know if things were broken and I was going to have to have surgery or anything. Uh, a doctor back in uh, Salt Lake City told me, geez, I see these dislocated hips all the time. I just put them right back in, uh, right on the ski slopes and things. And so I uh, had four hours of rush hour traffic. They x-rayed me and nothing was broken. And then they just, whatever they call it, and put the hip back in. And the amazing thing is, that, and this is really kind of hard to process if you saw the collision and you remember the injury, is that you were back playing not much more or even a little less perhaps than two months later, right? That's right. I was in traction for a month and then on crutches for a month and then the Mets, out of the goodness of their hearts, uh, activated me in September and I was with the team and being a cheerleader, which is an awkward role, after you're playing in that. And so uh, I didn't expect to play, but they even activated me for the National League Championship Series and, and then the World Series. And so all of a sudden, I get into two games in the World Series. Haven't played for two and a half months. And, uh, Was that your first game action since the injury, yes, the World Series? Yes. Wow. And so I pinch hit against Vita Blue in the second game. and. First pitch I didn't see, so uh, I said, I better start swinging be as he's starting to wind up. And so I did and almost hit a home run, but it was a ground ball up the middle that I thought I had a base hit and Campy Karen Panaris went over and caught the ball and great play and threw me out. 
All right, so wait a minute now. In the scorecard, it reads six to three. In your mind, was that an absolute rope on which you were robbed and to this day feel as though you had something taken from you? Yeah, it was something okay. like uh, against the fence or something like that. No. <laughs> well, it was a ground ball over his head, and uh, I think he must have been playing up the middle because that's usually a base hit. So, uh, And then the next time in the fourth game, uh, Cleon Jones was sick out in left field and he was throwing up the whole game. Well, come about the sixth inning, uh, Yogi sends me out there. And uh, sure enough, first man up, Sal Bando, hits a line drive into left center field, and I react, it was cold, and I reacted somehow, and went over, made the catch, threw it in like I knew what I was doing. Uh, I was afraid you were gonna say you slid into something a little less <laughs> than satisfying given Cleon's condition. No, and. And then the next batter, Gene Tennis, hits a hard ground ball single, and I go down to pick it up on one knee, and the ball takes a bad hop and is about to go over my uh, right shoulder. I grab it with one hand, catch it, throw it in like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> Nobody remembers it, but <laughs> that was what happened. But you see, that's, I mean, that's the, the best part of this is that there are certain players along the way, and Pete Rose was one of them, a guy you played against. He could probably recite chapter and verse, not only about the 4,256 hits that he had in his career, but all the others on which he did not get a hit. How vivid is your recall of memories other than the ones you just talked about? First at bat or anything else in particular kind of stand out? Well, you know, when I made the team, it was like you're on the team. It was in spring training, 73, spring right training. out of the spring? Uh, in 1972, I had a pretty good year with Hank Bowers, the manager of Tidewater. I played that winter in the Dominican Republic, San Pedro de Macorís. And so when I got to spring training, I was pretty much in shape and uh, earned a position on the team. And with the idea that when they need another pitcher, probably I'm the first to go. Well, I got a chance to play a few times and did okay, so they sent Rich Childs, my buddy, down. And, uh, and so I kept and I, I did pretty good. My first at bat was against uh, Steve Carlton, pinch hitting in the cold. I worked him for a three and two count, and the next pitch is six inches outside. I'm walking to first base, and Shag Crawford says, you're out, strike three. Well, come on. I want to talk to Shag right now. <laughs> Did you have to make an appointment or you went right to him? <laughs> uh, so, it's anyway. Rookie initiation, you think? Yeah. Better an umpire, I, rookie? I guess. Hall of Fame pitcher on the so, mound? So, to me, it was at least six inches outside. Maybe on replay would we'll say it was on the corner. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's interesting, though. Because you're a big man, you present a rather large strike zone. Is, is that a difficult thing for a hitter to negotiate when he's your size? Well... I used to like to kind of hit like Yogi Berra. If I could see it, I could hit it. And I didn't care if it was high, low, inside, outside. Uh, I'd like a good swing. I didn't walk too much. You'd have loved all these analytics today. <laughs> now, you asked about memories. Let me give you some Tug McGraw stories. Sure. Tug McGraw, who was the fireman, and everybody used to send him little toy fire trucks and things. And at the first of the year, 73, he had a rough time. He was blowing some saves that he didn't usually do. And I remember after one game that he had blown, he grabbed all those toy trucks, his hat and everything, put it in the center of the clubhouse and started jumping on them and breaking them and just really freaking out. And, uh, and he was our real emotional leader and catalyst, too, of the team. Uh, what a wonderful guy. And my second vivid memory is we're coming home from some road trip, and we all put in a dollar, that uh, uh, pot, for whose luggage comes out first. And so there's a pot there, and we're all waiting to see. And then all of a sudden, the turntable starts, and coming out and sitting on it, uh, his luggage was Tug McGraw coming <laughs> on. Sitting there. on it. So. The laughing, <laughs> smiling. <laughs> so, yeah, those are some of my big memories right there. Well, you go back to 1973 during that period of inactivity. It really wasn't until 
late August into early September that the Mets incredibly made the move that they did. I mean, they were 10 games under 500 in late August and wound up winning the National League pennant, going to the seventh game of the World Series. Before you could get on the field to help, did you see any of that evolving, or were you as shocked as everybody else? I wasn't shocked at all. Uh, we had lots of injuries uh, to key players, and uh, like Buddy Harrelson going down, what a glue to the infield he was. And Jerry Grody, my goodness, what a, what a person that really led the team he was. And so uh, the different players all started to come back and get healthy, and, uh, and nobody was running away with the league at the time anyway, so it could have been three or four teams that won there. And so uh, that didn't surprise me with our pitching, and we had a very underrated hitting team too, a uh, clutch team, and we had a good chemistry too. Uh, similar to what I'm seeing with uh, this current Mets team, you know, we seem to root for each other and really pull, and uh, and it uh, gets contagious, and so no surprise, good team. A lot of times, managers, and you've experienced this, I'm sure, they either get too much or too little credit, depending on the situation. You know, Gil Hodges, of course, and for good reason, has been canonized here, and we just pray that next year when he's up for consideration that he finally gets into the Baseball Hall of Fame. But, but following Gill was Yogi Berra. What was Yogi's role in what happened in 1973 to you? Well, Yogi was more laid back and there wasn't pressure on you and he made decisions. He had good people around him with Rube Walker and Roy McMillan, Eddie Yost, uh, Joe Pignatano. Uh, I think they all worked together, but uh, Yogi came from in the Yankee organization where they did a lot of platooning, so he did that. He wasn't one that was analyzing things too much, and he wasn't one to tell you what to do. You know, go out and do it, you know, <laughs> play it. <laughs> you, you were known to have been a free-spirited personality. Yogi was known to be Yogi. How did you guys mesh? Well, I think we meshed real good. Uh, in fact, uh, he sort of helped me with philosophy. You know, uh, at one point he had a headline in the Daily News that said, I'm human, ain't I? And they were asking him about why he made this mistake or something. And uh, uh, so uh, I've taken it from there to know that, uh, wondering uh, if I do exist, do I have significance? And all of that comes from Yogi Bear. So, so uh, Yogi was an existentialist in the end. That's right. I never would have known. <laughs> and forget about the end. In the beginning, and uh -huh. to this day, George Theodore is from Utah. And I only say that with some sense of incredulity because, A, you're the first and only Met to have been drafted and come out of the state of Utah. And because I don't know that it's known for a great baseball program, just like Brandon Nimmo, a Met who is from Wyoming, was a first round draft pick and didn't play conventional high school baseball in Wyoming. They didn't have any kind of a, a, a real diversified program. What about in Utah? He's a real story too. Well, we had more. So, I mean, the baseball season was slightly longer, even though uh, in the spring for high school ball, oftentimes we would play our first game after never getting out of the gym. Uh, when I signed in 1969, I was one of the last people signed, and uh, there was two other uh, Salt Lake boys that signed, we all signed together, and uh, Tom Kilgore and Von Opelis, and so that was unheard of. You know, usually uh, not too many people are, are signed professionally from our state, and, and the Roy Partee had kind of followed us, and uh, he was the one who signed Great me. scout, for those yeah. who don't know. Yeah. There was a connection you had with the fans. That was pretty clear. They responded to you. Why? And did you get to know any of them and maintain any sort of friendship or relationship after your playing days? Uh, I don't know why, uh, and I appreciated it. I always would sign autographs and uh, appreciated people recognizing me. Uh, I gave my best. Uh, it wasn't always my best, but whenever I walked off the field, I'd say, be proud that I tried my hardest and I kept my head high. And so 
I'm not sure they related to me because maybe my size and uh, that, but uh, uh, I sure appreciated it. And they appreciated you all the way to where you got a couple of at-bats in a World Series. And I know that's something you can be proud of the rest of your life. Yeah, very true. George, great to see you back here in New York. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Howie. That's the stork, George Theodore, my guest on this edition of One on One. I'm Howie Rose. We'll see you next time.